Hello my friends! It is another exciting Monday and we are back with Dev by Design. <laughs> so for those of you that have not watched before, Dev by Design is where we talk about design foundations and basics, but for a development audience. So for devs that want to level up their UI skills a little bit, want to work better with the designers on their team, or just interested in design, just learning a little bit about design. This is for you. You're in the right place. Welcome. <laughs> Today, we are going to continue. Uh, we've been working our way through color recently. So we talked about the color wheel, and then we talked about different kinds of color schemes and how to create color schemes. Today, we are talking about color and emotion, the kind of uh, associations that we have with color, what they mean to us, what we think about when we look at them, uh, and how you can leverage that to choose colors that will make sense for your project, uh, as well as some things to be aware of in terms of like different cultural associations or meanings that you might not have been aware of. Um, should be a good time. So welcome, welcome. I am glad that you're here. Uh, this is, I think, our last one talking specifically about uh, color theory and foundations. We're going to have next week a like things to watch out for uh, episode where we do like common mistakes made with color. And then after that, we will be talking about what's new in CSS with color. So leaning a little bit more on the dev side of dev by design, that will be week after next. And I'm excited for it already. Uh, but today, psychology of color, emotional associations with colors, how we can use that to our advantage in user interfaces. So colors can be kind of broadly categorized into two main sections. There are warm colors and there are cool colors. Uh, even without really digging into that, you can probably already kind of guess how that works. Warm colors are reds and oranges, yellows, browns, uh, those kind of lighter colors that evoke feelings of like warmth and sunlight. Whereas cooler colors are like blues, greens, purples, stuff that we associate with like water or cold. Uh, these are associations that are kind of hardwired into our brains and so they're not easily shaken. And when we try to create like cool feelings with warm colors, we are setting ourselves up for a hard time. Hey, welcome Kevin. Glad you're here. <laughs> uh, so beyond those kind of realms of like pure, like warm versus cold, like literal sensations. We can kind of extend those warm and cool feelings into some like broader categories. So warm colors in general tend to be like energizing. Uh, they're kind of passionate and exciting. They're vibrant. Um, we feel like excited by them. On the flip side, cool colors tend to be more like relaxing or logical, peaceful, soothing, subdued. We see them as like trustworthy and dependable. And it's not to say that any one is better than the other, they're just kind of different. So when you're trying to choose a color, you'll kind of want to think about what you want to convey, right? So like when people open your application or interact with your brand, what do you want them to feel? Do you want them to feel like they're engaging with something new and cutting edge and exciting and like kind of up that passion and excitement level? On that side, maybe like a warm color would be a better fit. Whereas if you're going for something that feels uh, kind of longstanding and traditional and dependable, a cool color might be more up your alley. So this is something that's a little bit easier to kind of get a feel for if you can see some colors. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do that. <laughs> Let me share real quick. So I've put together I grabbed some logos, right? Probably logos that you've seen before. I've kind of organized them into warm colors on the left, cool colors on the right. You kind of start to see that break down a little bit. So there's a few here, but in general, you can kind of feel that shift in energy uh, where when you're trying to evoke that kind of like warmth or playfulness or engagement, we see brands lean towards reds, oranges, yellows. Whereas when we're going for something that's a little bit more industrial, dependable, uh, 
more tech brands and stuff lean towards those cool colors uh, on the right. So of course, that's just kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, you'll see brands that cross those lines all the time. So it's not something that is necessarily like really hard and fast, but there's a reason why there's probably more like cool colored icons that are on your phone than like warm colored ones. It's because that tech lands solidly in the cool colors zone, things that are like logical and grounded. You'll also see that like lots of banks and institutions will kind of lean towards those deep, cool colors. And on the flip side, you'll see like kids brands, food companies, uh, games lean towards warm toned. It doesn't have to be that way, um, but I found it's helpful to think of it as kind of a visual shortcut, right? So anytime we're designing, the goal is to communicate some kind of message, right? Uh, ideally, as fast as we can, because we don't often have our user's attention for that long. So we get just a few seconds or maybe a minute or two with our users where they're actively engaging with something uh, unless they've really already committed. So here I'm thinking of like icons, logos, um, stuff where we're trying to get their attention real quick, maybe as they like scroll through the app store or like see an advertisement on Instagram or whatever, where we wanna capture their attention as long as we can, but we know we don't have that long and communicate something really, really quick. In those situations, using color as that kind of shortcut or shorthand can get us a lot of distance in a little bit of time, you know? So when we're working like that, the best thing that we can do is to kind of lean on all of those tools that we have um, to communicate quickly. Once we have our users' attention, it's a little bit of a different story. So once we have users that have like signed up or made an account and are coming back to our application, we can't quite take that as like a given that they will be there forever, you know? And in general, the goal is for them to stay engaged as long as possible, or at least until they have completed whatever task they came to complete. And so then we get a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, we can start to play with our designs and think about what would be interesting, what would be surprising or delightful or fun uh, in ways that we don't necessarily always have the luxury to do when we just have that like split second to get someone's attention and say something really quickly. So a little bit of a tangent, but also eh, maybe not too much of a tangent. <laughs> it was enough on track that hopefully you communicated uh, that it depends. <laughs> I feel like that's going to be the asterisk on a lot of design stuff. Is it really depends? It depends on the context in which your viewers are seeing your work. And it depends on how much time you feel like you have to communicate what you're trying to communicate and kind of how important it is. So, oh, hello, hello, welcome. I am happy that you all are here. For those of you that joined a little bit late today, we are talking about the psychology of colors, the meaning, the emotional association, uh, when you will choose which colors and how that might benefit you. Good morning. Hey, oh, I know it's not morning. I just did that in another meeting too, and it was embarrassing. I continually get on meetings with people from all around the world and then say good morning, like only my time zone exists. I am aware of it. It is a terrible habit, and yet I seem incapable of breaking it. <laughs> it's honestly getting embarrassing. Uh, it's a New Year's resolution for me. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> Remembering that everyone is not in the same time zone as me. <laughs> same. Yeah, I don't know what it is, especially I think in the morning when my brain's not running on like full cylinders yet. I just get on. I'm like, mm, good morning. Nope, wrong. Every time, wrong. I need to come up with a new greeting. I need another cool catchphrase that I can use to replace good morning. Not that good morning was particularly cool, but yeah. Anyway, so we've taken a look at kind of general uh, associations of colors, warm and cool colors, warm colors being more like energizing and passionate and exciting, cool colors being more stable, dependable, traditional, uh, logical. But we can break it down even further 
because uh, there are associations that we make with each individual color. Colors can have multiple associations. In fact, usually there's kind of a literal association and then also a more abstract uh, kind of mental association that we've created. So blue is a good example. We've looked at it a bunch in these like tech logos over here, Intel, IBM, etc. We see that all sorts of tech logos, super, super common uh, because it's seen as that kind of intelligent, logical color. But blue also has a very strong literal association with water. <laughs> You'll see blue a lot as well in like drinks uh, that want to communicate like hydration or in like water parks and stuff, you know? Uh, both are valid and they're both being used equally effectively to convey very different ideas. Uh, in fact, one might say opposite ideas as tech and water do not usually go well together. So what's important here is just being aware of all of the associations uh, and making sure that you're making an informed choice for whatever you're trying to convey and that you're not accidentally leaning into one meaning or another. Uh, See if you're looking to convey something more tech using that blue, you might want to be aware of things that are like teardrop shaped or wave shaped that might accidentally lean you into that water association when you don't really want it. <laughs> so again, nothing is really set in stone so much as like just awareness, just awareness of how people think and what they will think about the colors that you use. So that being said, don't need to have that up anymore. <laughs> We're just going to kind of go through some individual colors and talk about what they're associated with and pull up some examples. And when you have questions or thoughts, put them in the chat. Um, I was telling someone the other day that like live streaming is fun because there are people in the chat. I'm like I can record videos and put them on YouTube, but that sounds boring. I'd rather chat with you guys. So feel free to interrupt. <laughs> Jumping in, let's talk about red. So red is usually associated with really strong emotions like uh, passion, danger, energy. It's usually an indication of extremes and that doesn't necessarily mean bad extremes. It just means really extreme emotions and situations. So a really common example of this one is obviously uh, like love and romance. We see red connected with that kind of like romantic passion a whole lot. Um, and it's a good example because you can kind of look, there's different ways you can convey love, right? So like, especially with Valentine's Day right around the corner, you see lots of pink and red, right? So pink can also be used to convey love, but it doesn't feel quite as passionate or extreme as when we use red. Red kind of has this like, can't come up with a really better word than like passionate. Uh, but that kind of extreme romantic love, whereas pink feels a little bit like cuter and more of like an infatuation. It's just the same emotion on different levels. Oh, I think we've still got the release bot on. Let me see if I can turn that off. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, <laughs> this week and last week have been release week over at the Kendo UI family. Oh, thanks, Ivana. So, uh, I'll take a, a quick side note from this to tell you guys that we do have some really cool stuff. We just did our R1 2022 release. We did live streams last week. We're doing webinars this week. So it's not too late. <laughs> if you haven't caught one of our streams, you can yet still learn about all of the exciting things in our R1 release. Um, and probably Nightbot just gave you a link. Ha! <laughs> just silence the night, but thank you. <laughs> Much appreciated. That's the that's the danger of having a stream first thing Monday morning uh, before anyone else has streamed yet. Is <laughs> it's just whatever's left over from what people were streaming last week. But we're talking about colors. We're talking about red. Um, so in kind of a twist on love, we also see red used for that like strong positive association of like things that we love that might not necessarily be in a romantic way, but that just like, uh, yeah, things that, things that we like. Uh, a lot of food brands actually really leverage this um, to evoke kind of those strong positive associations with their product. So if you think about like, especially fast food logos, so many of them are red. Let's see if we can. 
I'll throw my screen back up. We'll do a quick Google. Because I bet, yeah. Look at these guys. Overwhelmingly red toned on this screen. Because it has to do with that feeling of like excitement and infatuation and, and like really liking something. Um, there's also been some research that shows red is uh, like an appetite stimulant, which eh, there's been some kind of conflicting views on that. With some people saying yes, and some people saying, yeah, does it really matter? But we do know that we use red for things that we like a lot. And that could just as easily be McDonald's as it could be someone you're in love with. Uh, on the flip side, we also see red used to denote danger. And that's a little bit more literal of an interpretation. Uh, because red is uh, the color of blood, which sounds, again, a little bit dark <laughs> to talk about, at least for me, first thing Monday morning. But it's something that we have a very visceral reaction to because we've learned that in order to survive. That's an evolutionary trait. Um, and we have a really long ingrained association between red and things that we need to be cautious of so that we don't end in a pool of blood on the floor. Um, so we see that leveraged with like red lights, stop signs, uh, fire trucks, error messages, like stuff where we want someone to go like, whoa, 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 stop right away. Uh, <laughs> go no further. Which is an interesting kind of contrast between red being like, yay, we love this. And red being like, don't, oh my God, don't. <laughs> but it has to do again with that kind of literal versus mental association. And pretty much any color will have that where we will think of things that have the same, that, that just are that color. And then we will also think of how that color makes us feel uh, from like a psychological perspective. So moving on through the color wheel, orange. Orange, uh, kind of symbolizes creativity and youth and enthusiasm. And it kind of comes from like a red yellow combo. We'll talk about yellow next, but it has that like excitement and really strong passion that comes from red combined with the more like playfulness and vibrancy of yellow. So we'll see orange a lot in like children's brands or like playful things. Um, like the Nickelodeon logo is orange. I'm trying to think of some other ones off the top of my head. Um, but we see it a lot in that kind of stuff, toys um, and like, yeah, just things that are that are fun, that are playful. And then in a more literal sense, orange is also kind of associated with like health uh, and vitality, high energy, strength. Uh, this kind of comes from its associations with like natural stuff. So like vegetables, carrots, oranges, bell peppers, like we see that kind of stuff uh, is often that kind of orange, yellow. And it conveys that idea of like being super healthy, being strong, being like, you know, full of vim and vigor. <laughs> we see that with brands like Gatorade um, or like there's a gym over here that's literally called Orange Theory. Oh, yeah, Orange Theory Fitness. <laughs> Obviously capitalizes on that. Their whole deal is orange. Um, and it conveys that idea of like, energy and excitement and having that that healthfulness to to do all of those things a few more folks in the chat hi welcome <laughs> glad that i'm offering some new things that you might not have considered before happy to help uh i'm sure my design teachers would be uh grimacing at my <laughs> summaries of their lectures from ooh, unfortunately for me a decade ago but yeah, uh, I do find this stuff super, super fascinating, if you can't tell. Um, I love design and I love color and I love that it's not just guesswork, um, which sounds really silly. But I think a lot of people, when they look at design, think that it's more guessing and it's more just trying to figure things out. Like, and if you know, you know, and if you have the eye then you can do it. But really all of this is based in science. And we know that these associations exist because we've measured them and we've, you know, <laughs> we, we've looked into this. We have uh, asked people and, and heard back. And so we're not just guessing or just hoping that we choose a color and it works. Like this is psychology based approach to design. Um, and pretty much all of design works in that way where you can 
trace it back to some kind of theory or something that we have measured. There's a scientific basis for a design. Um, and my hope with this series is to communicate as much of that as, as I can. So a little bit of a side note there, but uh, that's why I'm so excited about it. Um, but we are working our way through the color wheel, talking about individual associations with each color. Thus far, we've talked about red and orange, so it must be time to move on to yellow. So yellow uh, conveys happiness and hope and cheerfulness. We see it used a lot in brands that want to feel uplifting or kind of convey an emotional brightness to their users. Uh, it can also be associated with speed or with energy, think like lightning bolts and stuff. Um, it kind of shares a little bit of that with orange. That's kind of part of where they overlap. And that's also kind of true with all of these because there will be places, you know, where red blends into orange or orange blends into yellow. And you can start to kind of leverage the benefits from both colors. Um, same way with yellow, you can get some of that like speed, energy, excitement, vitality that you get from orange, but also with this slight twist of like happiness and like brightness and joy um, that can be really nice. Yellow also has the option to be a very natural color. I think a lot of times when we think about yellow, we think about that like neon yellow, right? That like very bright uh, kind of yeah, extreme yellow. But there's also like a much paler yellow. Let's see. Let's see what happens if I just Google yellow. <laughs> of course I get cold play songs. That makes perfect sense actually. But yeah, so there's lots of yellow. And so something like this, or something like this, these guys will probably give you more of that like energy, excitement, vitality. Whereas something here, these like paler, more pastel yellows will start to give you that like natural feeling. And that happens because of that more literal association. It's a color that we see recurring in nature's uh, like flowers and bees and spring. Um, but it's also one of the first colors that humans were able to create natural dyes for. So when you think about those kind of like organic dyes, we saw a lot of like light yellows, light oranges, light pinks. Um, and that pastel color kind of, that association still hangs around uh, where like a pale or a warm yellow can kind of convey like organic or all natural or like kind of crunchy, you know, in that way where something is, is naturally derived. Green, on the other hand, conveys like freshness and growth and forward movement. I'm just gonna, we're just gonna keep Googling colors. I think it gives you a good uh, kind of backup. <laughs> Green gives us that feeling of like nature, obviously. It's a very literal association with the uh, grass and trees and plants, things that grow. Um, and we can convey that same kind of emotion of like potential or newness or opportunity when we use green. And it's based in that very literal interpretation of like physical plant growth, but we can abstract it into that feeling of like potential or human growth. Uh, we also know that green can be kind of an encouraging color. Like, you know, green is a the go. Think of like getting the green light or like green check marks. A lot of this actually plays off just being the opposite of red on the color wheel. And so when we have this really strong danger association with red, um, this like idea of like blood or danger, on the flip side, on the other side of the color spectrum, we have green, which means like good, safe, life, like, yes. <laughs> we see that a lot, especially in user interfaces. We see a lot of that like red green combo to communicate like acceptance or denial or like go or stop. Um, it's good. It's a good visual shorthand. The thing you do have to be aware of here is people who are red, green, colorblind. Uh, that's a very common form of colorblindness. And when you can't tell the difference between those two things, then uh, that idea of like, you know, green means go, red means stop, loses a little bit of its power unless you provide some context. So I think I've talked about this a little bit before, but color should never be the only way in which you're communicating information. It should always be paired with something else that's giving you that context, right? So 
that could be icons, that could be text, that could be placement. Like, as long as there's something besides just the color that's communicating an idea, you're good to go. And colors are powerful. Like, you, you want to make use of them as much as you can. You just don't want to depend on them exclusively. They're just one tool in your toolbox. And, you know, you'll get further using all of your tools <laughs> than you were just one. <laughs> uh, with green, it's also worth noting that uh, mostly in the US, green has an association with prosperity and with money. At least that's the color of dollar bills over here. So that's one that's worth being aware of, but also being cautious with because that's not uh, an association that's global. And so if you're working with something where you know that you have a global audience, an international audience, um, green for money is not necessarily going to hold up. And we'll talk a little bit more later about cultural associations in color and like things to be aware of there, but just worth calling out with green. Moving on to blue, which we touched on just a little bit before. Blue gives us the kind of feeling of like calmness and serenity, uh, as well as kind of like intelligence, tradition, dependability, things that are very like stable, you know, uh, stable and, and smart and grounded. So we see this used a lot in brands that want to convey that kind of intelligence and like professionalism and dependability. Uh, we see it especially with like finance companies uh, banks like USAA or PayPal. We see it with like IT and tech companies, tons of IT and tech companies, especially like social media. He makes a huge use of blue Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, we also see it commonly with other large brands that want to position themselves as being really innovative. Um, so like IBM or General Electric. Uh, and as we talked about a little bit before, Blue also has the more literal association with water, which also kind of blends into where we get that like calmness and stability feeling. Think of like a cool, clear lake, you know, uh, or gentle waves. Something about the ocean feels calm and serene to us. And water has that same kind of association. But you'll see blue also used for like utility providers, water parks, natural parks, uh, or like drinks that want to leverage that kind of like hydration and water association. Again, it all depends on how you use it. So good comment in the chat. Says, how do you design a dark mode with the brand color as purple? If it's must also, what are also other possible ways one can do so. So I assume you're kind of asking about like the brand's primary color is purple. How do you design a dark mode around that? Uh, and correct me in the chat if I interpreted that incorrectly. Um, you've got a couple of kind of ways to go about that. Um, you could use purple as your kind of dark mode background color. So like you can see here, I've got uh, <laughs> Google and everything is in dark mode here. So where we've got black as our background color, you could use a very deep purple just as easily. Uh, and that would still look pretty sharp, frankly. Um, that's a strong way to do it. There's also no harm in using like grays and purples together. They do look good. Uh, if you went with kind of like a lighter, it sounds, it sounds silly to say a lighter dark mode, um, but you could do kind of a light, lighter gray so that you could get enough contrast with purple. It also kind of depends on your purple, right? So like if your purple brand color is a really, really deep purple, you know, if your purple brand color is this color, then that already naturally makes a good background color. If your purple brand color is this color, then you could use that as an accent color on our kind of regular gray or black um, and have enough contrast. So lots of kind of wiggle room places to play, but without knowing the specific color, hard to say. Um, feel free if you're comfortable to like drop a link in the chat <laughs> to uh, your actual colors, your color schemes, um, some kind of a screenshot. We can all take a look at it together. I think that would be fun. So get back to us and we can dive back in there. In fact, actually, that was a really good lead in. 
So purple is our next color <laughs> to talk about uh, meanings and associations. So purple is something that we primarily associate with luxury, um, like expense. By extension, also a little bit like religion, spirituality. We'll get back to that in just a minute. But originally, purple dyes were like crazy expensive. It was super hard to get uh, clothing and things dyed at like bright, vibrant purples. So anyone who could afford to wear purple clothing was someone who had money and lots of it. It was kind of a flex. So uh, that association kind of continues to this day. We saw lots of like kings and queens and royalty that would wear purple, I believe. And I think it's just like a, I don't want to say, it's not an old wives tale. Um, there was a rumor at one point that there was an English monarch who had forbidden anyone else from wearing purple. I can't remember who, like it was like Queen Elizabeth or someone who said no one else could wear purple um, and really cemented that association with royalty. Whether or not that's true, or just kind of a tale that the expense and the feeling of like luxury and money and royalty uh, continues to be associated with purple to this day. And then kind of by, um, by extent, by association, it also became associated with religion and spirituality. Uh, people would use it to signify a kind of power and respect. So uh, we get that feeling of like, uh, because it was so associated with royalty, because it was so limited and so hard to produce, that idea of respect and power and strength kind of got carried over into what people would want to communicate about their god or gods in religious groups. Um, that association, yeah, excuse me, that association today has kind of expanded more generally to like spirituality, mysticism, other general topics that might not necessarily be considered like religion. Um, but it's one of those things that has expanded right from one to another. So we started with like royalty, uh, kings and queens, and then that became abstracted to like power, respect, and then that kind of became abstracted to like religion, spirituality, mysticism. Yeah, generally. It's interesting to see how that kind of stuff evolves. A couple call outs in the chat, which were worthwhile. Purple and expensive dye. Yep. And jeans are blue because indigo was the cheapest dye that would blend with denim. I did not know that. That's a really cool fact. <laughs> uh, I love that kind of stuff. There's a lot. Um, there was one, I think it was Yahoo, the like, you know, email brand. Um, they ended up with purple as their color because it was like the cheapest that they could get to like paint their offices. It was what was available. There's all kinds of stories like that where something ends up with this strong association just because, uh, just because of how it worked out. I read somewhere also that like uh, Mark Zuckerberg is red, green colorblind and that's why he chose blue for Facebook because it was a color that he could see extremely clearly. Is it true? I don't know. Interesting though. Uh, looping back, Siddhartha shared some colors. Let's look at those up. And take a peek at the next colors that they're working with. Uh, where's my, there we go, that'll do. So we've got four, one, three. Or 7B. Dark purple. That's pleasant. And then with 5CB. Oh, with this light kind of teal blue. Yeah, I think in this case, I'd go ahead and leverage that natural darkness of the purple uh, with your 413 color um, and let that be kind of your background color. Um, you could even take it a step or two darker if you really wanted to. Let's see. Yeah, 413. Oops. Yeah, I would let that be the background of your page. And if you wanted to darken it, just a smidge more, that'll give you a little bit more contrast to play with. And then because you've got this nice teal color, the 55C, that's going to be a really good accent color to kind of pop against that deep purple. So I would use 
if it was me, <laughs> I would use that dark purple or maybe even darken it a little bit more and let that be the background color of your dark mode. Um, and then I would use that teal as an accent color for like buttons or things that you really want to like catch the eye. Um, that would probably be my approach. Again, without really knowing much about like the brand or the application or what you're doing, I think that could look really sharp. Um, those are good colors. It's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> Sometimes when you're working, you get stuck with colors that are like not great to work with. And that's not your situation, which is a blessing though. You could certainly do worse. All right, let's talk about Pink. <laughs> not the singer songwriter, but the color. <laughs> so Pink is kind of emotionally as well as literally of the lighter version of red, right? So we get a lot of the same kind of feelings that we get with red, uh, but lightened up a little bit. So instead of like love and passion and like romance in that kind of extreme way, we get more like sweetness or cuteness or like, you know, love, but not like an infatuation kind of a way. Um, pink is a little bit more playful. We see it used in playful ways, especially um, that sweetness sometimes gets used to talk about like sweet foods in a more like literal sense, you know, like uh, donuts or cupcakes or, you know, sprinkles and stuff. So we see that used, uh, especially like, I think Baskin Robbins is pink. We're gonna look that up. Yeah, yeah. Baskin Robbins leverages that pink. Dunkin' Donuts definitely leverages the pink in that same way, that like sweetness. Um, and then obviously like twice, you know, like Barbie, lots of dolls. It's often considered that kind of like fun and light, but also sweet and cute. Um, historically, of course, pink has also been really strongly associated with femininity. Can't talk about pink without talking about that, at least a little bit. Um, but I think it's worth noting that we're seeing that shift more and more that's becoming a less common association in fact both of those kind of gendered pink and blue associations are really starting to fade um becoming less common um and oftentimes not well received kind of depending on your audience a lot of people will push back against that um finding it kind of rigid or outdated um so we're taking kind of with a grain of salt there however there are still Lots of, especially older brands that will use it. Think like Cosmo or like Mary Kay um, that will still kind of leverage that gendered association of pink for like makeup or like women focused content. So I think that's really one of those know your audience things, right? We're seeing it shift, but if your audience is going to be uh, a little bit older, that might still be something you can leverage. Um, but especially kind of Gen Z, um, somewhat millennials, we're starting to see that shift away from like, girls are pink, boys are blue. So use with caution, <laughs> I think is what I would say. Next, let's take a look at brown. So brown is a very natural, like kind of earthy color literally uh, it has that association with like soil and dirt so we see it used a lot for like nature-based uh kind of all natural brands it can also have the feeling of like age you know um like old paper or like rust so sometimes we see it used to evoke the feeling of something being really old-fashioned or really traditional so kind of expanding on this, brown can be used to convey something that has stood the test of time and therefore is like more dependable or more trustworthy. Uh, it's kind of a less common color, especially in like UI design, which tends to be more focused on um, like things that are new and things that are cutting edge. But that's not to say that you can't also leverage it. Um, it can bring a little bit more warmth than like a like a white or a black or a gray. So it can be a really good option when you're looking to bring some of that humanity uh, into your design. Back in the chat. Oh, just designed my first web page for a video production agency. Congratulations, Jackson. 
That is awesome. Like, genuinely, that's so cool. That feeling when you, like, first do something and see it go live and, like, someone's actually using your work is so good. It never really goes away. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, like, <laughs> that feels very silly, too. But, like, I've done a bunch of design work over the years. It's still something that I do on the side, especially um, in a volunteer capacity these days. I work with a company, um, like a local nonprofit, and they put up a billboard recently, and it's still wild to like drive somewhere and see my stuff, you know? And I'm sure it feels the same way. Like you pull up a website just like out there on the web and it's your stuff, it's your thoughts, it's your design. Um, oh, you put a link in here. I unfortunately cannot copy and paste from the chat in StreamYard, which is something that drives me honestly insane. Um, it's really hard for me to pull up links. <laughs> so <laughs> I will check it out later, but for real, congrats. Like that feeling of like having your work out there never goes away. Oh, in my senior year of getting a degree in graphic design. I, yeah, that was, you're making me nostalgic about my own college days. <laughs> Being in art school was so much fun. Um, and there's a lot of times now when I wish that I could like, and I'm sure, I guess I could like email my professors or something, but uh, I wish I could like go back in time and be like, past Catherine, look, like, <laughs> look at all this stuff. So congratulations. Um, I guess, yeah, if you're in your senior year, you'll probably graduate in May, right? So soon, <laughs> best of luck as you uh, enter the professional design world. Holler if you have any questions. Uh, moving along. I don't really have to Google black for you guys to know what it looks like. Looks like this. Looks like black. <laughs> black conveys the idea of like elegance and sophistication and exclusivity. It's also kind of a shorthand for like cool or stylish. So I think like black tie dress codes, uh, sleek black sports cars, especially also like lots of tech related hardware. So not necessarily like the software, the applications, but the literal physical stuff that you hold, like uh, cords and cables, microphones, laptops, monitors, game consoles and controllers. Black is a really common color there. And admittedly, that's probably a practical decision um, just because black doesn't show as much wear. We went through that rough phase of like cream colored electronics that like start to look really gross. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just old. Let's see if anyone remembers the like, I can even pull it up. Yeah, maybe old computer monitor will do it. There's like CRT monitors. Yeah, that looked like this and got like disgustingly sun faded almost immediately. Uh, so we've pivoted away from that towards black that doesn't do that. But now by association, we get that like tech kind of feeling uh, associated with black. So uh, you'll also see it used with brands that want to convey something being like expensive, but also worth it. <laughs> so um, there's also kind of a feeling of, of um, things being very classic, especially with black and white used together. Um, you might also see black, gray, and white kind of used together in that feeling, um, kind of similar to like brown, that feeling of like age. Um, but it's a little bit more, I'm trying to think of like the, the right emotion for it. It's the difference between looking at like a sepia toned photo and like a black and white photo. There's just a different energy to it. It's a little less human it's a little less worn in the same way but can still be used to create that idea of like timelessness or age or just something being really classic cream color electronics are amazing uh i would love to agree with you here but honestly my favorite genre was the like early 2000s like clear color uh electronics so let's see like Let's see if that actually brings up what I'm thinking about. These guys. <laughs> That's my favorite genre of uh, computer hardware history. 
the IMAX, the like see-through N64s, like phones where you could see the whole inside. Oh my God. Bring that back. I miss that. <laughs> so, and finally, of course, you can't talk about black without also talking about white, which I don't think I need to Google for you. <laughs> but white uh, gives us a feeling of like simplicity and minimalism and peacefulness. So it kind of conveys the idea of just, yeah, just, uh, just room, room to breathe, which by extension can also convey the idea of expense of luxury as well due to those associations that we have with white space. Like if you can afford to buy a whole like page of newspaper and only print one thing in the middle, you got money. Similarly, like if you have a big house, you have lots of space, you know, that feeling of not being crammed together and not trying to like optimize and fit everything in as closely as possible to like get your money's worth kind of feeling. The idea that like you have it, you have room to spare comes with white. You can afford the square footage. That idea of like peace and neutrality kind of comes from that as well. Having those like large unbroken spaces where your eye can rest. Uh, there's nothing to distract you. There's nothing vying for your attention. There's not, you know, blinking lights and sounds and noise. It's just space. <laughs> so you can use white in that same way. And actually like apple is the go-to example of that, right? So like, yeah, look at that. Huge use of white space. They are just the masters of it, honestly. They'll like give you so much room <laughs> to rest. Ah. But yeah, you'll see it on their website. You'll see it with their physical products as well, where there's just, they use white, in all of their boxes and it conveys this idea of yeah just purity and expense and luxury um which they do they do well again like not even talking about their products just talking about their brand positioning and their use of color they've got it down so give me a minute clear electronics came from prisons I did not know, like, so you could see inside and make sure no one was sneaking things in. I did not know that. <laughs> That's an interesting fact. <laughs> um, but now you kind of know, now that we've gone through <laughs> all of the ideas of colors. Oh, Elena's here. Hi, welcome. Uh, popping in to say hi before our stream later today. Yeah, actually, for all of you that are watching, you should come back today at, let me make sure I get the time right. I'm pretty sure it's 2 p.m., but also uh, extremely chaotic. Yes, 2 o'clock. Come back at 2 o'clock for UI Mondays. I will be interviewing Elena here. We're going to talk about uh, Tailwind and the femininity of CSS, which is an article that she wrote, which was incredibly thought-provoking and interesting. And I am thrilled to have her as a guest on UI Mondays. So uh, come back. Same. I guess it's not the same bat time. It's just the same bat channel. Come back later today, 2 p.m., uh, and joined in on that conversation because it's guaranteed to be a good one. But talking about color, now that we've kind of gone through the meanings of individual colors, it's worth talking about avoiding like mixed messages. So when you sit down to create a color scheme, in addition to some of the stuff that we talked about last week, as far as like how the colors will literally look together and how they work together, you also kind of have to think about the associations of each of those colors. It's good to kind of sit down and brainstorm other associations with each color that you're considering. And having other associations doesn't necessarily mean that it's a deal breaker, you know, that you should just like throw those colors out. Um, like we talked about blue, huge in tech, it does not mix well with water, but you'll see that all the time. Um, you do just want to make sure that you're not sending mixed messages and maybe consider if you could make your messaging a little bit cleaner and clearer by leaning into any pre-existing associations rather than having to do all of that work from scratch. So let's say as an example, you are creating an application for like a local yoga studio. So right off the bat, you can kind of rule out colors that are really bright, really loud, like neons, right? So you're probably not going to go with like 
a bright neon blue or like a, a neon green. It doesn't feel right for a yoga studio. They have a vibrant energy that just doesn't align well with what you're going for, unless this is like techno rave yoga, in which case like sign me up because that sounds bomb. Um, <laughs> but assuming it's more usual yoga, you'll probably want to lean towards colors that are a little bit more natural, right? Now you can kind of dive a little deeper and go like, what kind of yoga is this, right? Is this like a hot yoga studio or is this like an all natural kind of uh, like crunchy organic place? Or are we talking like yoga, but spa and meditation and like massages and, you know, uh, saunas and stuff? Or are we talking like a gym, you know, like high intensity interval training and like yoga lattes and stuff that that's intended to like burn calories and get you fit all of those will probably use different colors um so like the hot yoga place will super benefit from those warm colors right like deep reds deep oranges that association with warmth and literal heat will get you a long ways if it's one of those kind of natural organic places maybe we're talking like sage greens and rich browns those kind of like earth tones that say like natural and grounded. Uh, if it's the spa and meditation center, then we're talking like whites, blues, neutrals, cool tones, things that feel relaxing and refreshing. Whereas if it's that gym that's there to burn calories, then you're probably talking like oranges and yellows, right? That idea of like vibrancy and health. So all that to say, you could take <laughs> one project, one thing, and use colors to convey completely different ideas. What you would get from like the natural, like browns and sage greens, what you would expect walking into that yoga studio would probably be different than what you would expect walking into the like deep reds and oranges yoga studio, you know? The other thing to be aware of when you're choosing colors is where your app will be used. And we talked about this just a little bit when we touched on green, how green has a cultural association with wealth, but only in the States because of the color of the dollar bills. But that kind of thing happens everywhere with a bunch of different colors, right? So like white in the US has a strong association with like purity or cleanliness. We see that often extended towards like weddings, right? The idea of like the white wedding gown. Um, similarly, we tend to favor black for somber occasions like funerals, you know? But in China, white is a color of mourning. So you'd see that. You'd see white at funerals and red is a color of celebrations, which you might see at weddings. So if you already know that you're gonna be working on an international project, you should be sure to do some research on the meaning of colors in that locale. And if you're not really sure where your users are, you might wanna stay away from colors that you know have vastly different cultural uh, implications in that way. Some things are really universal. That idea of like green as nature and growth, like blue as calm and stillness, those things are human, you know, or red as danger or warning. All of those are gonna kind of cross cultural boundaries because they're an innate human experience. So you can lean on those kinds of colors in those situations. Or again, as we talked about before, you can provide different kinds of context to clue your users in on kind of what you're thinking. Uh, you could do that with like text or icons, um, just other stuff that you can offer to kind of say like, oh, when we do this, we mean this, you know. Always good to make sure that uh, color is not your only means of conveying information. Ooh, voice starting to go. So choosing your colors. When you are thinking about a project, um, at least when I'm starting, I like to do a little bit of like word association. So I sit down and I think like, okay, when I, if I'm a user and I open this application or I start this program, like, what do I want to think? What are the associations that I want people to have? You know, do I want them to feel like they're having fun? Do I want them to feel happy or joyful? Or do I want them to feel like serious? You know, do I want them to feel supported? Do I want them to feel uh, safe, you know? And based on that, you can kind of start to choose your colors. 
So let's look real quick at a couple real world examples that I pulled up from a couple different applications. So here I have some screenshots. Let me see if I can, there we go. Zoom in, they are always smaller than I think they will be <laughs> when I'm on stream. So these are uh, screenshots from the USAA banking application, right? Um, so they're showing, you know, your transactions, your credit cards, your account statements, normal bank stuff. But as you can see, they've gone with this really deep navy blue um, that works really well for them, honestly. So USAA is also a military associated bank in the United States. So their audience is primarily going to be like service members and their families who are there to complete finance related transactions. <laughs> Uh, unsurprisingly, their primary color is this really deep blue, which they're using to evoke that feeling of like trustworthiness, reliability. Um, the specific shade of navy is also taking advantage of associations with the American flag, which uses a similar shade of navy. Um, we can see here in these ads, they're using this yellow as an accent color. So complementary color schemes for those of you that were here last week. They're smartly taking advantage of that. And then they've also got some other design elements that they're using to reinforce that feeling of like tradition, longstanding, trustworthiness, safety, um, things like all capitals in their text um, are a good way to do that. The amount of white space that they have, good way to do that. Um, we'll talk more about some of that kind of stuff, typography and layout in future episodes. But for now, just know that that's all kind of supporting their color choice. On the flip side, these are screenshots from Duolingo, which is a super popular language learning application. I love it. Duolingo is probably one of my favorites uh, when it comes to looking at like UI design and color choice. I think the way they have positioned themselves and the way that they do user interface work is super smart. Um, genuinely one of my favorites. So Duolingo leans really heavily into their green color, uh, which is like they're leaning on that idea of like freshness, of growth, of learning, of expansion, excitement. Uh, it feels new, but not in a stressful way. So you can see even here, they're kind of still leaning on that like cool colors. Uh, so they're still very much like technical. They're still uh, borrowing that idea of like intelligence and uh, logic. But they are leveraging some really bright colors in their accent colors that help uh, borrow that like energizing feel from the warm colors without fully crossing over into being like a warm colored brand. So it gives them this very friendly and approachable look, um, which they support with layout choices like lots of rounded corners. I don't think there's a single like hard 90 degree corner in all of Duolingo. And that gives them this very approachable, like safe feeling. Um, they support that obviously with this font, which again, like very rounded, very fun. It doesn't feel like a, a traditional serif font. Their illustrations are super fun and playful. All, <laughs> everything in their interface is really working together, but they've chosen colors intelligently that really support that. So, you can think now kind of about applications that you use most often. You think about like, what's their goal? Why do they want you to log back in? What are they trying to help you accomplish? And how do they want you to feel, you know? And have they chosen colors that support that? Probably the answer is yes. Um, when a user describes that application or your application or your website to someone else, what words do you want them to use? You know, do you want them to say like, this feels bright or this feels energizing or this feels fun, you know, or do you want them to say like, this is dependable or this is reliable, or, this feels traditional, you know? Um, and again, there's not, there's not a right or a wrong answer because it will depend entirely on what your application is supposed to do. Um, so that's not to say that things that are traditional are boring or things that are, you know, energizing are exciting and good. 
you wouldn't want your bank application to look like Duolingo. <laughs> you would feel unsettled. You would not feel as secure if you logged into your bank and it looked like this, you know, or it looked like a children's application or it looked like a game. Um, there are ways that you can bring feelings of lightness and newness, um, but you just want to balance them. You just, design is about balance. <laughs> it is about balancing what you want to communicate with what your users expect um, and what the general understanding and the general associations of like colors, type, and uh, layout will be. So all of those kind of questions will point you in the direction of your color palette, your overall visual style. Um, and in fact, that's really kind of the heart of all design work is identifying what specifically you want to communicate. What problem are you trying to solve? What are you trying to tell your users? And then discerning your overall visual style based on that. The more you learn about those kind of art and design fundamentals, the more tools that you put in your bag for problem solving. Whoa, did we just get rated? Our audience went way up. <laughs> Hello, welcome to everyone that just joined. You are actually kind of at the end <laughs> of our episode today. So uh, vaguely unfortunate timing, um, but we'll do a quick recap. This is Dev by Design, where we talk about design basics and fundamentals for a development audience so that you can improve your user interfaces and the ways that you work with designers on your team. Today, we were talking about color and the psychology of color. Um, we talked about warm and cool colors and the kind of emotions that they convey. Uh, we talked about the meanings of individual colors. We talked about the kind of different cultural interpretations of colors and the ways that you can use color in your UI to more effectively communicate. We did get rated. Thank you, Fritz. Welcome. <laughs> uh, all I care to think of is functionality and security. Yeah, that's true. Um, definitely, if you can't actually deliver the goods, then the design is second. And that's something that I think uh, sets apart like design and art, right? So art has this wiggle room where the uh, function is second to the form. So with art, you kind of get to there is a message often still communicated. When you look at a piece of art, there's usually trying to get you to feel something or uh, evoke some kind of a feeling or a message, but the way that it's presented is more important necessarily than what it itself is doing. Whereas design is kind of the flip side, the function comes first. Uh, so with something like a bank application, the functionality, the security is first up, but that doesn't mean that the form is not important. And in fact, uh, making sure that you have the right form is what gets people in the front doors. You know, um, They won't ever know how secure or functional an application is if they look at it and it doesn't feel like something that they want to put all of their money and assets into, right? Design is kind of the handshake, it's the hello. Uh, so making sure that you've chosen colors or you've chosen typefaces and layouts and other, you've, you've made intelligent design choices that support what you're actually doing. Um, if you're skimming through the app store and you're looking for a financial application, maybe a budgeting app or a bank app, you will make uh, knee-jerk assumptions and associations based on the design, the design of the icons, the design of the interface, all of that genuinely matters. And I would also argue plays into the functionality. Because if you have an application that's really difficult to use, um, then you won't bother, especially for something important where you're trusting stuff. Uh, you're trusting your literal money, your income to someone. Design kind of gives that first feeling of like, is this person trustworthy? Is this a place that I should put my life savings, <laughs> you know? And I bet if you opened up a bank app and it looked like Duolingo, you wouldn't put hundreds and thousands of dollars in there. <laughs> welcome, welcome. We have lots of folks. Hello. Thank you for those who came from Fritz. 
what software do you use for UI design? Uh, I like Figma. And let's pull it up real quick. Figma is really great. Um, and in fact, if you're looking for an introduction, I actually happened to write an article recently called Figma for Developers. I will throw it in the chat. Uh, it's a good introduction. For folks that are wanting to dip their toes into UI design. But uh, I really like it. Um, and it is free to get started with. Um, they do put some limitations on like collaboration. So other people that you can invite to your files and uh, some of that is limited, um, but it is free to use. You can make as many drafts as you want in their free version. And they, let's see if I have a good one I can pull up that we can use as an example. We can look at our Figma kit. So Kendo's got a Figma kit, which is cool. <laughs> because it has all of our components broken all the way down into their smallest pieces, allowing you to customize. So here you can see kind of the general Figma overview. Um, you've got your pages over here, which are kind of, think of them as like pages in an application, usually. Um, and then frames which are each one of these. So you might think of those. This isn't, this is a good, this is a good example <laughs> for what it's trying to do, but it's maybe not the best introduction to Figma to look at the Figma kits, but oh well, they're open now. Frames here, opening up a frame allows you to focus in on each element. And then on the right hand side, you can edit those elements by changing like the fill, the stroke, the base color. It's kind of a high level Figma uh, overview. Prototyping, if these were different screens in an application, you could connect like buttons to different pages so that you could mimic uh, interactions, user interactions that way. And then the part that's really nice about Figma is this inspect, which breaks down each element into the CSS properties. So your designers can create something and then uh, have the code exported here, either properties that you can copy or they'll kind of generate um, code, which you know, take as a good first step, but not necessarily the be all end all. Always good to double check machine generated code. Can you convert those Figma files to other technologies? Um, the answer is it depends. Yes, asterisk. Um, so there's this kind of inspect here that will always give you the code uh, which you can put in to your application. Um, depending on what you're using, you might be able to leverage it directly. So like with the Figma kits, actually, we have created uh, a program called Unite UX. So the TLDR is that to move things directly from Figma into your application, you'll need some kind of third party go between. Um, the good news is there's a lot of these. We have one at Telerik. There are others elsewhere. Um, obviously, this is the one that I would recommend. Unite UX is really sharp. So this is a project that I already have set up in Unite UX, and it is connected to my um, LCARS system. Where is my, there's my search. So I have a demo application for Kendo that looks like Elkar's menu system <laughs> from Star Trek. Uh, let me get it. I'm pulling it up. You can't, I should move this over here so you can see what I'm doing, which is running my application so that you can see how it looks. <laughs> so for example, talking about moving things from Figma out. This is my application. Um, I use it to demo all of the new kind of React components. Uh, it's a lot of fun because I figure if I'm gonna have to code things, I should have a good time with it, right? Like, and I'm a huge Star Trek fan, so I've created this application. I used our Figma kits 
to do so. So you can look at components here and zoom in. And we can see, by example here, how I have adjusted all of the Kendo UI components to look like the LCARS UI, right? So they don't normally look like this. If we were to pull up the Kendo React docs, we can see, right? They have kind of a more general look, which makes sense, you know, their starting point. But I needed things to look like this, right? I need them to be uh, these colors, and I need them to have all those rounded corners for buttons. And I did all of that by adjusting the base components in our Figma kits, right? But then to get it from Figma into the application, I used our Unite UX plugin, which we'll go through. Nope. Oh. Let's see if that was the right password. What a fun time for us. Don't remember my password. No. Oh, there we go. Thank God. That's always fun to do live on camera, not remember your own passwords. So anyway, using the Unite UX plugin, I can go through all of my pages, all of my components that I customized, select them all export them, right? And it gives me a quick confirmation so I can see like all of my LCARS colors are being used here. I can create, I will create a new project here just for demo purposes. And it will export all of my information from Figma into Unite UX. Um, once we've done this, I'll answer some other questions while this progress bar thing is happening and then we'll jump back over, but you'll see that from Unite UX, I can then export things directly into my project. So first of all, hello, can we use Figma for Android apps? Yeah, so Figma actually is completely uh, framework agnostic. Figma is a design system, uh, it's a design software, sorry. Um, so you can use Figma for literally anything. Uh, Figma is optimized, is designed for creating user interfaces, um, but you can use it for print design too, if you really wanted. It is really just, it's just design software. Um, so it is commonly used for UI design. So yes, you could totally use it for Android apps. You could use it for iPhone apps. You could use it for websites. You could use it for React, Vue, Angular, whatever you're designing. doesn't matter. You can do it in Figma. I am not as familiar with Android app development, so I don't know if there are any kind of third party programs that will allow you to export directly the same way that I'm doing with uh, Unite UX. But so that's something you might have to look up. But there are lots of these kinds of plugins, is what they're called uh, in Figma, that allow you to get the stuff out of Figma into the code. <laughs> so, and honestly, even something like this, it wouldn't work. I'm trying to think about you. Unite UX will also export you like uh, CSS files, right? So like that's universal. Um, Figma will not export your component code directly, but I think that's a good thing, right? Because like, if you've ever seen machine generated code, like it's not cute. It never looks good. It's always kind of unpredictable, kind of bug ridden. It's getting better than like Dreamweaver days, but I still think it's best to code things by hand. But if you can get these kind of like, I've got all of these styles, right? I've got all of these colors, uh, all of these kind of design tokens that were part of the Figma design. And if I can get those out and into CSS properties, now we're talking. That's made my life a hell of a lot easier. Is it possible to apply flowcharts in Figma? So um, you mean just like to create a flowchart or do you mean to like create a prototype? Because I guess the answer is technically yes to both. Um, Figma is really good at prototyping, um, which is basically like allowing you to connect buttons with you know other stuff so that you can mimic the act of like clicking on something and then going somewhere else. Let me see. Ooh. Okay, whoops. Let me see if I've got a good example. Oh, this is a good prototype example. 
Uh, I did not create this. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> this is a, like a Figma demo, right? So uh, this shows the way in which you can use Figma to kind of create the idea of interactivity without having had to have coded anything, right? Um, and when you do this, when you make all these connections, you can kind of put it in this like mode, right? Where you can click and it will kind of show you what you can do, right? And will mimic uh, moving from one thing to another within the application. This is really good for like user testing. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to uh, connect some things and like put things in front of your users and let them like click and play with things and see what they expect and what they anticipate and get their feedback before you actually have to put in all the work of coding it, right? And so it's a huge time saver. It's a great opportunity for you to get that kind of feedback before you put in the development time. It allows you, it puts you the developer in a place where you can code with anticipation for what your user needs and you're not just coding reactively based on the feedback that you're receiving. Um, which is really, really useful. <laughs> so, hello, hello, welcome. Thank you for following. We're so excited to have you. <laughs> Code It Live has got a ton of great stuff, so you're gonna love it. And then, hello, welcome. Um, you are catching us in the middle of a Unite UX demo. So, oops, I already had that window open. So over here, this is, I was exporting earlier from my LCARS Figma file. Uh, and this is what we have on the flip side. So let's see if I can do this. So you can see over here, this is divided into two halves. On the left, I have my Unite UX export preview. So this is the stuff from Figma. On the right, if I can zoom in, I have my actual components, right? So, uh, left is actual Figma file, right is uh, LCARS components. You can see there's a couple places where things haven't lined up quite right. I could adjust those, uh, but for now we're gonna kind of look at the opportunity uh, here. So over here, it's got all of the design styles that it has turned into text or into code. Yeah, can't talk. <laughs> I've been on this dream for like, an hour and 20 minutes and I'm starting to lose my mind just like a little bit. It's okay, that'll be fun. Um, <laughs> so I've got all of my uh, CSS files over here that they have extrapolated from Figma. Over here, I've got design styles they have tried to automatically apply. I can make adjustments. I can uh, live preview and see what's different. I can inspect and compare my components across. Um, and when I'm ready, this is the really cool part, I can export. And um, this is what we were talking about earlier about getting stuff out of Figma and into your app. So over here, this is what I have exported. In this dist file, I have got all of my tokens all of my fonts, all my stuff that's been put into this incredible SAS file. They do have it in like regular CSS as well. So I could get that if I wanted to code in vanilla CSS, but that's boring. Who wants to do that? Anyway, I can throw that file into my uh, application and Obviously, this was made to work specifically with the Kendo UI component library. So it'll match up all of these, like, yeah, here's my uncompiled CSS, which I'm sure is just a monstrous file, frankly. <laughs> I think my computer is lagging trying to load that giant CSS file. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't stream and open that massive CSS file all at once, as it turns out. Anyway, let's look at the SAS file because it's uh, a little more concise. So all of these uh, variable names 
line up exactly with the uh, variables that are used in the Kendo UI library, in the component library. So I can throw this SAS file into my application and it'll just work. Like, it's that easy. It's crazy easy. We got our index here that just imports everything, overrides if there are any fonts, which mine only has the one, but if there were multiples, that would all be exported here. All of that gets linked into that index file. So you just add these guys into your app and you're good to go. So like we can take, we can see an example here. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard for you guys to see the side window, but I don't think I can make it any bigger. Over here in my LCARS app, so this is this application. I've added that SAS file. I've streamed it down so it's just it's the colors are in here, but it just clicks just like that with my uh, components. So it was a long answer to your question of, can you convert Figma files to other technologies? Um, the TLDR answer is yes-ish um, with the help of the third party library. And yeah, again, it'll export it will export some of the stuff. Um, you don't wanna do code export directly from Figma because uh, that'll be gross. <laughs> but uh, for those of you that joined us via RAID, we were actually right at the end of an episode of Dev by Design where we were talking about color, psychology of color, the meaning of colors. Um, we went on a little bit of a side note here with Figma, which I'm always happy to do because I could talk about Figma forever but we were mostly, honestly, kind of wrapping things up over here um, before we officially wrap things up. Did anyone have any other questions about Figma, about UI designs, about colors? Really anything, open field. <laughs> uh, and if not, I hate to, to keep moving you guys along. Maybe we can raid somebody else and pay it forward. Let's see. Is Ivana still in the chat? <laughs> I don't know that she is. But anyway, well, I think maybe we'll leave it there for today. I hope you guys do come back. A um, couple of quick announcements. We've got every week, Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern time, Dev by Design. So if you do want to come back and learn more about like design foundations, design basics, next week we are talking about color mistakes to avoid. And then the week after that, we are talking about uh, the future of color in CSS, which is going to be a really cool one where we talk about like P3 colors and um, some of the new color definition methods. So you won't want to miss that for sure. Later today at 2 p.m. Eastern time, I will be back on for UI Mondays with a special guest, Elena, where we are going to be talking about um, her article, Tailwind and the Femininity of CSS, which was really, really interesting. So if you wanna take a little bit of a deep dive into kind of our perceptions of femininity versus masculinity and some of the languages that we work with, tune back in 2 p.m. Eastern time for UI Mondays uh, and we'll be back, so. Thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate having you guys here. It was such a fun surprise to get that uh, raid. I hope you all have a great day and a great start of your week. See y'all later. <laughs>